GPU bids. Everybody, thanks for coming. Um, GPU is a project that uh, I've been working on with Hadley Wilson at our studio. Um, let me raise this mic up just a second. I guess that's, that's as high as it goes. Okay, so uh, what is GPU Viz? Um, it's a packet for interactive data visualization to make it easier to explore uh, data and communicate findings. And it is a synthesis of ideas. Uh, um, uh, well, what the main source is the Gremlin graphics, and this is that implemented in GGPlot2, which probably most of you are familiar with. Um, it also brings in reactivity and interactivity. Uh, many of these uh, ideas come from Shiny. Um, it also incorporates a, a new data pipeline, uh, and many of these ideas come from GPI. Finally, it's made, uh, it's built of the web. It runs in web browsers. It's meant to be delivered over the web. And uh, a lot of this comes from Vega.js, which is a JavaScript um, visualization library. Okay, so my plan is to touch on each of these topics and, uh, and along the way give a show of you demos. So, um, grammar of graphics. Now, if you've used GGPlot2 before, this should look familiar. Um, it's similar, it's, uh, but it's there are some important differences. Now, this is a, a this is a typical scatter plot with a, a lowest smoothing line, um, and the way to use it is you start with the data, um, then you pass it to GGVis using this funny operator, um, and then you tell it to uh, map this column or this variable weight to the horizontal position, and map this other variable MPG to the vertical position of the points. And then we use an operator dim, which I will explain later, and uh, add a layer of points. And finally, add a, a, a layer of smoothing lines, or in this case, it's just one smoothing line. So that's a really basic scatter plot example of a smoothing line. Um, now, if you do more than just you know, a scatter plot with uh, black points, you can map other variables to other visual properties. In this case, uh, we're mapping. Uh, the cylinder column um, in the data to the fill color. So uh, there's four, six, and eight cylinder uh, rows, and uh, they're displayed in different colors here. And you can also create histograms. Um, in this case, we're uh, just telling instance other data set called cocaine, and mapping the potency variable to the x, and then we pass it to layer histograms, which does some bidding on the data and um, displays these bars like you see. Now, if you've used QViz, uh, or sorry, QPlot from, uh, from GGPlot, um, GGViz doesn't have that, it, but you can use a sort of simplified uh, syntax like this, and it will try to figure out what type of plot you want, given the, given the variable mappings that are there. So that, that's similar to QPlot. All right, so that's a really brief overview of the, uh, uh, of the syntax and how it uh, is similar to GPlot2 with the grammar of graphics. Um, the next part is the data pipeline. So uh, GGViz has a functional interface, and each GGViz function takes a, uh, takes a visualization object as an input and returns a modified visualization object as an output. So uh, in the first line of code there, you see P, we assign that to GGPIS with empty cars and some of these, uh, and the X and Y mappings. Uh, and then we, uh, in each row, in each line here, we modify that. So we say P is layer points P, P is layer smooths P, um, and finally we print it just by, uh, when you're at the console, you just type P and hit enter, and that will display it. So that's, that's, that's one way of uh, creating plots, but um, you, uh, the examples that I've shown have been using this funny operator. So this is from the MacReader package, uh, and it's, it's also used extensively in dplyr. Uh, it's a piping operator, pronounced then, and it takes the output of uh, the left side and uses it as the first argument of the function on the right side. So a real simple example, uh, if you take, um, oops, if you were to you wanted to write take a subset of the empty cars data set, you do normally you do something like this. So um, 
And the first argument is empty cars, and then you're selecting out some uh, rows and columns out of it. But that's equivalent to doing it like this uh, with that the then operator. Um, empty cars, then subset with some arguments. It, uh, the then operator puts it as the first argument of this, this subset call on the right. And that's used extensively in ggbiz. So, uh, so the first form on the top is what I just showed you, where we just modify this object over and over again and save it, uh, and save it back into the same variable. Um, the, second, uh, the second block of code there is I'm showing how you can do it as a one-liner, but you can see it gets very confusing matching of arguments with the function calls. And finally, this is the way that uh, we, we're using it in ggviz with the then operator, which makes it very clear what you're doing at each stage. Uh, and some of these layers perform a computation on the data. And uh, so when you're creating a histogram, that's equivalent to um, taking the data, uh, doing a binning operation on it, so there's that compute bin there, that modifies the data, and that modified data gets used uh, for other things that are further down on the pipeline. Uh, in this case, we just add on rectangles using that, that modified data. Okay, um, so next up is reactivity and interactivity, and this is the part uh, that I think is most interesting about ggviz. So it, uh, ggviz extensively is thread through with react reactives from Shine. And so I'll explain a little bit what that's about. Um, in regular programming, when you call a function, um, it happens once. You know, there's some input, and um, and then it does something to it, and then it returns an output. And that's when, once it's done, it's done. Um, in functional reactive programming, uh, a reactive can take a value from another reactive, and this creates a dependency graph of the reactives, uh, which persist. So uh, we have here a is used by B, B is used by C and D. Now, um, in normal programming, if you have a value A and it's used by B, once that computation is done, it's over. But, uh, and, and changing A later will have no effect on B. But the functional reactive programming, and what happens in Shiny, is that when A changes in the future, it tells everything down the line that those, uh, they need to recompute. So um, every time A changes, B, change, B updates, and C and D also update. And this is really useful for interactive, um, for interactive, for, uh, well, interactive graphical user interfaces. All right, so now I'm gonna show some examples with this. Um, in this case, we have a histogram with where the slider, where the slider that controls uh, uh, the width of the bins. Okay, so in this particular data set, you know, it looks, you might think, oh, well, this is a unimodal data set that's Kind of skewed. It's kind of funny looking, but um, we have a slider uh, to control the width of the bins, and, and when you're looking at histogram. It's really useful to uh, look at it at different resolutions to see, you know, to, to look at different aspects of the data. So when it actually turns out that this data is bimodal. All um, and not only can the computation parameters be controlled with uh, reactive inputs like this. Uh, the data itself can be reactive. So in, in this case, uh, don't worry too much about the code. It's, it's basically a, a data frame that updates itself every two seconds. And in this case, again, the data is itself is updating. And every time it changes, it triggers the, uh, it tells the graph to update, and uh, the marks, the graphical elements are um, redrawn every time the data updates. This other demo to go with. This is a uh, grand tour on the data set, which is. Uh, projecting a high dimensional data set into two dimensions and uh, updating several times every second. Alright, so finally, um, I want to show you some demos of 
uh, integrating ggbits with Shiny, and that's where you can get the most sort of the most power out of it. Um, the examples that I showed you so far are relatively simple. You're just controlling uh, one thing with uh, with some inputs, but you can actually build more sophisticated uh, applications using using Shine. And uh, and uh, here's an example using uh, a Shine interactive document. This is this is sort of a, 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 a recent thing that we've done. It's a combination of the other our mark on Shiny, um, and now we're throwing ggbiz into the mix. And, uh, so if you've ever used our markdown, this should look pretty familiar. When we run it, though, um, what we have is not just a static document, but one that is, has uh, dynamic components. And so for ggbiz, uh, with this ggbiz plot here, we're it lets you mouse over and display some more information about these points. Um, in this lower example here, uh, it has a you know the histogram with the dynamic bin width. And the code to do this is uh, is pretty straightforward. You can see there's not a whole lot to it there. Now, a lot of the interaction that I showed you was just interacting with sliders, um, but you can actually interact directly with the plot. So, for example, you can do brushing. Um, in this case, let me make this a little wider, we have two plots and they're linked together. So I can select points here, and uh, those selected points will, well, there's a histogram on the right showing the uh, the selected points and the overall data set as well. And you know, for a data set like this, it, it's not obvious when you're first looking at it that uh, most of the data, the vast majority of data, is just concentrated in this tiny little region in the lower left. But when you when you brush over it like this, that makes with the histogram it makes it a lot clearer. And also the data, uh, the selected data, as you can see, there's this uh, summary on the bottom that updates every time I move this. So, so those, the selected data um, can be used for more than just graphics. You can pass it on for further analysis. Okay, so that's that's uh, using it with um, interactive documents, and uh, you can also use it with regular Shiny applications. Uh, here's one where, again, it's a demonstration of brushing, where I can select some points and. Uh, it updates this linear model, or this, yeah, this linear model for just those selected points. And what happens is uh, those selected points are used as a new data set, and that data set is re-injected into the data pipeline and the computation is performed on it, and, uh, and it tells the client, it, well, it, it recomputes the linear model and, and sends that information to the client to display. So uh, the future, um, there's a few, there's some things that we still need to do. Uh, we need to, well, we're planning on implementing self-visualizations or also means faceting. Um, the zoom in and panning, so you can click and drag and zoom in and out with the mouse wheel. And uh, we need to fill in some gaps for ggplot2 feature parity, like, you know, uh, just put setting up uh, box plots and other uh, types of plots like that. Uh, we want to improve the performance. And uh, also implement scriptable file outputs so it's so that these plots can be generated without a browser. Right now they're they're actually rendered in the browser, um, but we want to make it possible to do it without a browser as well. And uh, you can find more information on this website. And uh, I will later on uh, send out a tweet with the slides and code and use our 2014. Uh, Alright, I can take some questions. Yeah. This is, it's actually rendered in the browser. Um, there's, you, Vega.js is doing the rendering, um, and it, it can actually render using uh, SVG or, uh, or using HTML canvas. So it's not using any of the R graphics at all. Okay, so it's all based on JavaScript. Yeah, exactly, it's all JavaScript. 
Yeah. So does it make sense to uh, uh, to implement the, the then operator in ggplot so there'd be consistency rather than the, the plus operator? Uh, the question is, does it make sense to implement the then operator in ggplot so there's consistency? Um, that would be nice, but the way that ggplot is designed is fundamentally different, so I don't, that would be a massive rewrite. Um, is the structure linking the various elements necessarily acyclic? <laughs> that is, um, if I change A, B changes. For example, you uh, rush points in the scatter plot, and that influences the histogram. Could I also select a bar in the histogram and see it in the scatter plot? Or is the relationship only one way? Okay, the, the question is is this relationship between these plots, um, is it a one way thing or can it be implemented um, bi directionally? And, uh, it can be implemented bidirectionally, although um, you have well, you have to be careful about how to set up these reactives so that you don't end up in you know, some sort of uh, infinite loops. So it's it's possible, but it requires a little bit of extra work. Yeah. What are the largest um, data sets that you can plot without the rendering of the reactive? Uh, the question is, what are the largest data sets that um, that you can use with this? Uh, the, there's really two parts uh, of any answer to that. Um, the the in-browser rendering is it is it's implemented in JavaScript and uh, using SVG or Canvas. And when there's a lot of objects on the order of I don't know, I'd say about maybe like 10,000 or more. Like if you have a scatter plot with 10,000 points, it can get a little sluggish when you're trying to interact with it. If it's static, then it's you know then it's it's fine. Um, but uh, if you're really dealing with really large data, then you likely will want to do some computations on it. Um, some are sort of you know shrinking the data down before it's displayed because you know like displaying a scatter plot with 100,000 points is not very informative anyway. And those computations happen in R, so um, and so that's as fast as R can be. Which you know if you're if it's really important, the computations can be implemented in C, making it really fast. And we're planning on doing making more of those computations happen in C. Right now they're using R code. Yeah? Is there a way to capture the images in like a JPEG? Oh yeah, yes, that's a good question. Is there a way to capture the images? Yes, uh, there definitely is. So um, let me just run one of these again. All right, so after you, you know, you played around with your interaction stuff here, you can, there's a little gear icon here, and uh, you can choose the render, SVG, or canvas. And if it's, and depending on which one you choose, it lets you download a PNG or SVG file. Um, and again, this is, you know, this is, it requires some human inter interaction to do this, which can be good or bad, but um, depending on your use case. And uh, so one of the things, like I mentioned, that we want to do is to make it so that you can generate these files. Uh, the output without having to interact with it this way. Yeah. Uh, what version of R? This is using. I think I'm using R 3.1.0. And if you're using an older version, you may have to upgrade. There's a lot of dependency packages that are not required newer versions of R. Uh, one more question. One more. Yep. Uh, the question is, what about themes and custom colors? Uh, is that is that available here? Um, you can change the styling of many of the components, um, and you can change like the, the color palettes used by uh, these uh, categorical color scales. Um, one feature that sadly we don't have yet is the ability to set the background color. So it's instead of the ggplot2 light gray, it's uh, it's just white for now, and hopefully we'll. Um, it worked well, I think that might require some modification of Vega, and hopefully we'll be able to implement it there. Okay, thank you very much.